Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you all. Has it been a good build so far? Oh, yeah. It's great to see you. I uh, wasn't sure how many of you would still be back in your hotels uh, playing with your new Xbox Ones. Um, but it's great that you decided to come learn about the mobile, building mobile apps with back-end services. That's what we're going to do today. I have a quick service announcement that I'm supposed to read. <clears throat> the grand prize drawing for the Windows Code Challenge has been moved from 6 to 6.30 p.m. If you participated in the Code Challenge and have a blue raffle ticket, you should come to the second floor in front of the DJ booth at 6.30 p.m., okay? I hope you all have been coding, playing around with the new bits. Who, who's already in, uh, installed the new Visual Studio 2013 update, update two? Ah, oh, yeah, good. Yeah, we're going to be looking at those bits today. That's what we're going to be doing. This talk is about building mobile apps using the, the new you know, Windows Phone 8.1, the new Windows 8.1 update bits uh, that have back-end services that have web APIs. Now, I, I think when it comes to developers, there's, I, I think of, there's probably two kinds. There's, there's, there's this guy who's like a client-side developer, knows XAML, knows, knows how to MVVM his way to victory, but when it comes to on the other side of that wire, ooh, that stuff's scary. Servers, clouds, scale out, I don't know what to do there. How do, how do I do all that stuff? That seems complicated, that seems hard. Part of this talk is to try and convince you that it's not that bad. You can do this. You can build great mobile applications that have back-end services that can reach as many clients as you need them to. Um, you know, there's also this guy, which is, you know, is me. You know, I, I work on the server. I work on ASP.NET Web API. My name's Daniel Roth. I'm the PM on Web API. Uh, I am, uh, you know, not a, uh, uh, a UI XAML person, so you know, please forgive me if I offend any MVVM purists out there as I hack my way to victory for some of these client apps. Uh, but the point here is to show you how do you do the glue? How do you get stuff on the server working with your stuff on the client when the, when the client is a mobile application? That's what we're going to try and do today. All right. Now, th there are many mysteries here that we want to solve for building back-end services for mobile applications. You know, you've probably heard these terms, SOAP, and REST, and OData. These are all approaches to building these services. Which one should you use? People are very opinionated about these things. They can get very upset about them. Uh, what's the right story here? We're going to talk about that. Even if you pick one of these methodologies, these protocols, whatever you want to call it, architectural styles, uh, there's a bunch of, 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 of technology choices for how you then go to build it. You know, you know, in Microsoft, even if you're a .NET developer, there are frameworks old and new that you could choose from. Which one should you use? We're going to talk about that. You need a place to host your, your service. Where should you host it? We hope that Azure is a great hosting solution for you folks. Um, you need to be able to secure it. You know, th there are bad guys out there. There have been a lot of nasty headlines in the news of bad guys doing things, and they are, you know, they are persistent, and we should be aware of that. I, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I know I've talked to a bunch of developers that have built mobile applications that do have a back-end service, but when I poke a little at their security model, uh, it basically boils down to security through obscurity, right? You know, you know who you are. Uh, we don't want to be in that place. How can we actually build secure backends that you can talk to from your mobile application? We're going to spend a bunch of time on that. How do you consume them? You know, I've got multiple mobile apps I want to write. I want to be able to share that logic. Portable libraries are the thing. What about offline support? What about notifications? All these other concerns. We'll talk about that uh, as well. All right, so we're going to try and solve these mysteries. We're going to do some sleuthing and see if we can get some answers. Okay? First, let's talk about that first item, SOAP, REST, OData. Um, SOAP, I'm just going to get it right out front. You know, I worked on WCF, so I, I'm, I'm allowed to say this. I spent a bunch of time with SOAP. It's not a very mobile-friendly choice, OK? It's just not. I, I've done this exercise a few times where I've gone on the web and searched, you know, how do you call SOAP service from your favorite mobile platform? And I, you know, this is still one of the top three hits um, you know, on, on Bing. And you can see this is you know, someone showing you how you can string concatenate your SOAP message to victory. 
This is, this is not what you want to be doing when you're calling services from a mobile app. There, and it goes deeper than that. When, you're, when you use SOAP, you know, you're basically taking HTTP and just treating it as a transport, a way to get bits from here to there. You can do better. You can use HTTP as an application level protocol, make much more efficient use of resources on both the client and the server. Uh, but if you do need SOAP, like, and you may have clients or, or scenarios where you have to interoperate with some SOAP endpoint that's, that's out there, by all means, use WCF. It is the best SOAP stack on the planet, and if you need SOAP, you should use it. If you need something that's not HTTP, WCF is also the way to go. It was made to abstract away the transport. Now, this is very different than what I'm going to tell you that I think you should really be doing for your mobile applications, which is use HTTP as it was intended, as an application-level protocol. And there are tons of benefits with doing this. HTTP is ubiquitous. Uh, unlike um, SOAP, where most of these clients do not speak uh, that language, they do absolutely speak HTTP. You can talk to uh, uh, set-top boxes, phones, tablets, browsers. There's so many things. Like this, in the Internet of Things world, there's just going to be more and more things that can speak the language of HTTP. It's a good bet to get reach for your services. So you can build your services once and just reuse them. It's interoperable. You can, uh, different platforms can work on either side of the wire. It scales really well. We know that because it's the protocol used by the web. It's very flexible. You can put anything you want in that HTTP request message or the response. It can be uh, whatever media type, binary data, JSON, XML, form your encoded data, how, PDFs, you know, you have all that flexibility to create use and use formats that are specific to your application's needs. It's very simple, it's very mature, it's a great bet for building mobile applications. Now, if you're going to build HP services, hopefully I've convinced you that you should, um, you have some choices when it comes to .NET. You know, we've had the, the WCF Web HTTP stack was an attempt to take this square peg and fit it through this round hole, and we pounded on that peg for years. I, I helped out with that effort for a while. We tried really, really hard. But honestly, at the end of the day, uh, if you look at WCF at its base, it is SOAP. It is a SOAP message. It is XML infoset based. To sneak HTTP, raw HTTP through there takes a lot of tricks and hackery, and it shows. It bleeds. Um, so WCF, you're a bit swimming upstream if you're going to try and build HTTP services on it. That said, it's there, it's alive and well. We, Microsoft has a bunch of services built on it. If you have services built on it, that's perfectly fine. It's supported. It's not going away. Um, WCF data services is a way you can build OData services, which are themselves also HTTP services. Uh, we'll talk more about OData in a minute. Uh, ASP.NET MVC, you, you often need to be able to deal with JSON when talking to a browser, so there's a way to serve up uh, JSON from ASP.NET MVC. Um, that's, that was another option. We, we looked at all these options, and we decided, you know, we really would rather focus our efforts on something that was built from the get-go to be a framework for building HTTP services. And that's where ASP.NET Web API came from. It is a framework that is specifically for creating HTTP services that can reach as many clients as you need them to. So if you're trying to build an HTTP service today, our recommendation by far is you should be building on Web API. The other frameworks, they're there. If you're using them, it's fine. But the investment, the future, the focus right now is on ASP.NET Web API. OK? That's where we recommend you go. Now, why? Why would you do that? What do you get out of that story? You get a lot. ASP.NET Web API has a whole bunch of features that you can take advantage of. First and foremost, you will get a beautiful first-class HTTP programming model. It is literally the same programming model that you use on the client. And this kind of makes sense, right? These are Web APIs. These are things you're going to talk to programmatically. So the thing you're using on the client would be nice if it kind of looked like the thing you're using on the server. And that is absolutely the case with Web API. It's the same HTTP request message, same HTTP response message that you use on both sides of the wire. We give you a really simple way to, to define your HTTP resources, give them a, 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 an identity, uh, URIs, uh, and then to also implement the uniform interface of HTTP. To, to map out your URI space, we use ASP.NET routing. And recently, we also support an ASP.NET routing model, which makes that even simpler. Uh, your uniform interface is the lang is the, are the verbs of HTTP, get, put, post, delete, well-defined, well-understood. You can mix them, match them, and they are, they, you can get everything done with those, with those verbs. Uh, HTTP is about formats. We talked about that. We wanted to make sure that Web API did not limit you. You can use any format you want with Web API. We'll give you formatters out of the box for XML, JSON, formula encoded data. Now we support BSON, 
O data, and then add whatever ever custom formatters you'd like, okay? And you just plug them in, and they automatically will work with full support for content negotiation. What does that mean? That means when a client comes up to your web API and says, hey, if you have XML, that would be great. If not, JSON's okay, and if not, then I'll just take whatever else you got. In HTTP, there's a standard way to say that, and that's called content negotiation. And Web API just supports it, it just works seamlessly. I'll show it to you. We can validate the request messages, very similar to, to how uh, the support like an MVC, you, you can put data annotations on your types, we'll give you a bunch of validation errors and warnings that you can then process, send back to the client. Uh, we enable hypermedia by providing link generator sh generation helpers. Uh, you have great support for separating out cross-cutting concerns like authorization, caching, um, you know, dealing with various headers. You can take those pieces out and implement them as cross-cutting pieces, as filters, or as message handlers. Uh, we can generate your help docs for you. Isn't that wonderful? You, if you often with Web API, how do you know how to interact with it? Well, typically you need some sort of help page that says these are what my resources are. This is how you can talk to them. We can generate that for you automatically. Uh, flexible hosting. Web API can be hosted in IIS or outside of it. You can self-host it in a you know, Windows, Windows service. You can create a little executable and run it. If you have a, an environment where you can't, you don't really have the flexibility of asking people to install IIS for you, no problem. You can still deploy Web APIs into that environment. And the whole framework was built from the get-go. It's a fairly new framework. You know, it's only about two years old, I think. Uh, it was built to be lightweight. Uh, testable, there's no dependency on static state, no context, static context objects in the, anywhere throughout the stack, and it's all ba uh, asynchronous based on the new task-based async model. So lots of stuff, and that's just like the core. Like we've been working hard. Like we shipped Web API 2 with Visual Studio 2013 at the end of last year, and then early this year we shipped Web API 2.1. And there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff in these releases, attribute routing, uh, testability improvements, you, you can now do action results in Web API, kind of like how you did in MVC, so you can sort of encapsulate the responses of your actions and things that you can unit test. Uh, we support first class request batching, and we use that feature to implement uh, um, uh, rich OData support. We support uh, now dollar $select and dollar $expand and dollar $batch and dollar $value. You can build a full OData service on ASP.NET Web API. Uh, we are um, uh, we can integrate with any Owen-based pipeline. How many people have heard of Owen? Is Owen a new term? I see about half the hands go up. That's good. If you don't know what Owen is, Owen is uh, a really nice guy. No, I'm kidding. Owen is the uh, Open Web Interface for .NET. O-W-I-N. Open Web Interface for .NET. And what does that mean? It's a standard for how servers and clients can talk to each other. And it describes how you can then stick pieces of middleware in between. And what that means is that if your app is written against Owen abstractions, you can then take that app and make it run on any Owen-capable server, of which ASP.NET is a great one. We've, we deeply integrated Owen into the ASP.NET pipeline. We also have self-hosting stories where you can have like a little HP listener-style Owen server that you can host your apps on. Um, so very, very powerful stuff, and, and we've been implementing middleware uh, for concerns like authentication and so forth that you can then stick uh, in, into any app that's, that's running on Owen. So that decouples us, allows you to, to use components that not only work in IS, but also can work in those self-hosted environments if you have those constraints. Our, we do have some client uh, support in Web API uh, for calling Web APIs, and that uh, support is now portable. Some little helpers over the HP client. We don't give, it's not, not a, a lot, like we're not doing proxy generation or any of that, that type of stuff. It's a very thin layer, but at least helps you with concerns like dealing with deserialization and serialization in and out of JSON or whatever format you, you happen to have. Uh, we've done a lot of work on security. We're gonna be talking about that today. So OAuth 2, support for cores, authentication filters. That was all in Web API 2. You already have those bits in VS uh, 2013 if you've got that installed. In Web API 2.1, we did some improvements to our attribute routing so that you can write uh, custom attribute routes that can do things like have um, constraints or data tokens. Uh, we added a, a global error handling story so you have one place to hook into when you need to get errors or handle errors. Uh, we improved on the help page to give you a lot of type information. I'll show that to you. Uh, ignore route is now supported. I mentioned vSYN support. Whew. We're almost there. Uh, better async filters, uh, you can now easily derive from the, um, uh, what is it, action filter attribute, 
And if you want to have asynchronous logic in there, there's now an async overload. There was only a synchronous one before. The core was always async, but the little helper base class didn't really give, give you an easy way to do async. And lastly, I don't know if you've ever been frustrated when you did like system URI dot query dot and been like, where the heck are the name value pairs on the query string? Like, I want to get those out. Uh, we, gave, we have a portable implementation of query string parsing and also construction that you can just use now from, like if you have a Windows Phone app and you want to add those query parameters when you navigate, you can use our library to construct those for you. It's in the Web API client package. How do you get all this stuff? Everything we do is on NuGet. So if you don't have VS 2000, blah, 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 like the latest, greatest stuff, no problem. If you've got NuGet, you can just add these packages into an existing web application project, no problem. Everything we do is on NuGet. The Web API 2 bits, like I mentioned, are in VS 2013. So if you've got VS 2013, you've got Web API 2. If you're on 2012, uh, you can install the ASP.NET Web Tools 2013.1 release, and you can get the Web API 2 uh, 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 NuGet packages installed in some lightweight tooling. Web API 2.1 is shipping with uh, Update 2. So if you've got Update 2 RC installed, you've got Web API 2.1 bits there with scaffolders and so forth that you can just use. Uh, the 2 and 2.1 releases do require .NET 4.5. Um, so Web API 1 support .NET 4. We did move to 4.5 with Web API 2. There were some nice improvements in the uh, async stack that we, that we just wanted to take advantage of, so we're on, we're on 4.5 now. Uh, hopefully you are as well. Um, the docs and samples are all on, the, you can find them on the ASP.NET site. So ASP.NET slash Web API. ASP.NET slash Web API, okay? And if you're, if, if you're new, like if you're here because you're like, I don't know anything about Web API, I hear it's hot, and I want to learn about it, there is a complete free plural site training that you can go on there and just take. There's also one, uh, uh, the pieces of one on, on REST and REST architecture if you're interested in that as well. So if you want the full story, because I can't possibly talk about all those features here in the 60 minutes that I have, or the 43 minutes that I have left, uh, go take the plural site training and get completely ramped up, all right? Uh, the code is fully open source. Everything we're doing now in ASP.NET is fully open source, and you can contribute. A bunch of the big features that you saw on that list actually came from folks like you guys. They were contributions from the community. We just worked with folks and pulled in features. We checked them in. If you want to see up to the minute what our devs have, have checked in into the code base, you can go look in our uh, Coplex project and look at the source code and see it. You can, you can sync it down. You can build it. You can use it. We've also produced signed nightly builds of everything that we do. So you don't need to go wait for the official alpha or beta release of Web API 2. Whatever, you can just go grab a build any day and get the latest, greatest bits and try them out. They're on, we publish the, the nightly builds on MyGet, and the instructions on how to get them, how to wire up the MyGet feed, are on the Coplex site. So you know, if you want to ride on the cutting edge, or if you're waiting for a bug fix and it's finally in, you can go grab a build right now and start playing with it. Uh, you can even technically put those, those bits in production if you want. We're not going to stop you. Just take, take into account that they are, they are literally a nightly build of whatever the devs have happened to check in. They're not like an official release. So they don't, they're not supported bits, but feel free to use them. All right? Uh, yeah, so try them out. Give them a swing. All right, let's do some coding. Let's see it. All right, we're going to do file new project, and we're going to create a web API. Um, my first... Web API. Is this my first one? I don't think so. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, great. All right. If you uh, don't have VS 2013, haven't seen this yet, this is the new one ASP.NET dialog. Uh, this uh, basically takes all the ASP.NET technologies and puts them in one place so that you can mix and match and choose whatever you want. I frequently get questions from people saying things like, hey, Dan, I'm using web forms. Uh, this web API stuff looks great. Can I, can I use it? Yes. Of course you can use it. Like, notice that if I select Web Forms app, there are these checkboxes at the bottom. And Web Forms, of course, is checked. But if I checked Web API, then it will go ahead and install the new Git packages for me in the folder conventions so that I can use Web APIs in the same app as my Web, uh, as my web Forms application. No problem. Same thing with MVC. These things are totally mix and match. You're not, not like stuck in one world and you can't use the other world because you happen to have picked one technology. All right, uh, to get going here, now, now uh, there is a Web API template, you will notice. And the Web API template has a bunch of things already wired up. Um, there's even this, you know, this option here saying change authentication where I can configure my Web API template to have different authentication uh, configurations, uh, individual user accounts. What does that mean? That means like uh, my users are basically have their own username and password or they're bringing their own identity and it's not associated with any organization. The only organization is my app. 
I just happen to honor their Facebook account or their Microsoft account or whatever. That's what individual user accounts is. Uh, organizational accounts is they are part of a, a you know, an organization. They, they're, 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 their identities are in a directory and you want to use those identities. Um, that could mean either like Azure AD, where you have a, a cloud hosted directory that you want to integrate with, or it could be on premise like ADFS. This is new in uh, update to RC where you can now configure a secure web API to use an on premise uh, ADFS as an uh, OAuth 2 authorization server. So lots of cool stuff here. If you have a domain join machine, you can use Windows Auth just like you always could. But instead of doing all the bells and whistles all at once and throwing them all at you, we're gonna start simple and build up, okay? Start low, get up there. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick empty. Empty, and I'm just gonna check Web API. Sometimes people complain, you know, the templates have a lot of stuff and I end up having to delete things. You don't have to delete things. Just pick empty and then select the technology that you want, okay? And I'm also gonna click this checkbox. You've seen this, this is new in update two. I want to go ahead and create an Azure website because of course at some point I'm gonna have to deploy this thing into the cloud so that all those mobile apps can start hitting, uh, can use my backend service and make me lots of money. So I'm gonna select that and go ahead and say sure, let's do it. Okay, and my first web API, 606,000. <laughs> uh, how about my first web API demo? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so this is the UI for creating that website in Azure. I'm picking my site name. Yeah, West Coast sounds good. Uh, this one, I do want a database. So I'm gonna, no, don't create a new server. I just want a database, and I've gotta type in my password here for my um, SQL Azure server. That looks good, if I typed everything right. So it's now gonna create a project, it's gonna provision an Azure website for me, all in one go, okay? Now while it's churning on that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start writing a web API. You'll notice the only thing that I got here in this project is I got the web API pa assemblies, the package, let, let's look at the packages folder, that's a lot of assemblies. Okay, there's, there's the web API packages, json.net, we use json.net for our, our json story, and then I just get some folders to help me get set up. Uh, did, that, did it work? I didn't even see it. Web there it is, yes, overall status succeeded. We have a, a site in Azure that we can publish to as soon as we're ready to do that. Okay, so to do that, I'm gonna first create a model type. And add a class, do do item.cs. Okay, and let's give it, uh, we're gonna, here's what we're, we're gonna use the um, uh, EF code first conventions to define uh, to do web API, okay? String title. And then, bool is done. All right, that's probably good enough. And now I'm gonna put some uh, data annotations on this thing that I, that I want to be validated. Like it's required that you have to have a title for, for submitting a web API, uh, a to-do item to my web API. And I don't know, let's also say that the max length is 30 or something. Okay, does that look good? All right, let's build it. Okay, now I wanna create my web API. And I do that by creating a Web API controller. If you're familiar with MVC and new to Web API, it feels a lot like MVC. It's, it's, it's a separate set of types because it's self-hostable, but uh, it's a lot of the same concepts. Okay, and here's the scaffolders where I can just scaffold out my Web API controller. I want one that uses Web API, read, write actions using EF. Sounds great. So this means that I'm gonna have a backing store for my data, if EF, it's all gonna get wired up for me. To do item is gonna be the model type. I don't have a database yet, so I'm gonna go ahead and create a new database context. And let's simplify this just a little bit, to-do's controller. Okay, and then this is gonna run scaffolding, it's gonna just produce a web API for me that I can uh, go ahead and get running with. There it is. All right, let's collapse the definition so we can see what we got here. First thing to notice is that we're deriving from API controller. That's because this is an API. It's not like MVC you would derive from Big C controller. This is an API controller. And there are some differences. The action methods here are the HTTP verbs, okay? Your actions are HTTP verbs. You have get actions, put actions, post, delete. You don't have an action name that you're using. You are just gonna use the HTTP verbs as they were intended to be used, all right? So this is saying I, these are get actions. If there's an ID present, then we'll call this one. If, otherwise, just get me all the to-do items. Put, post, delete, okay? Uh, this to-dos uh, controller represents my to-dos resource, and it has an identity. Where does that identity come from? Well, it comes through routing. If we go look at the Web API config file, there it is. 
This is where my routes are set up for my Web API. And you notice there's this new thing, this is Web API 2, where we uh, set up attribute routing for you. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But the default route that we give you in Web API is, looks similar to the MVC one. It's prefixed with API so that the namespace is kind of separate. And then it's just controller and ID. There's no, notice there's no action variable here. And that's deliberate. Uh, the HP verbs are your actions. Now, if you put an action variable in there, it'll actually work just like MVC. You can do it that way. And that's more RPC style. This is more resource centric. And we kind of prefer this pattern, but both are supported. If you want to do calculator with add, put, post, delete, go for it. No problem. We're not opinionated. Okay? So those are my, um, that defines the, the URI space for my controller. Now let's go look at the, how do I implement the uniform interface of, of HTTP? How do I implement, for example, my, my post action? Well, first thing I want to point out is that if I go, oops, not redirect, but uh, request. If I go look here, on the API controller, we expose the HTTP request message, just like you have on the client, it's on the server. There's a request context that has everything that goes along with that request that you can then use to examine headers and uh, status codes and the content and so forth. Okay, this code is gonna run validation to see if you know, things that are required are there. It'll, if, it's, if it's invalid, it will return bad requests. And you'll notice that the response the, the return value for this action is IHP action result. That's a fairly new concept in Web API 2. It's very similar to the MVC concept if you're familiar with action results there. Uh, an action result is just something that has an execute method that returns an HTTP response message. You could also just return an HTTP response message, but the nice thing about returning action results is it makes it much easier to unit test because you can just new up the controller, call the action, check that the action result is set up correctly, and then you're done. Because if you've unit tested the action result already, then you know it works. You just need to unit test your code. And we provide a, a ton of action result implementations for you. Like this bad request is just one of a whole bunch that are hanging off of the, the API controller as helper methods. Um, you can, and you can trust that those are unit tested because you can go look at our source code and see, ah, there's the unit test. So there, they must work, so I don't need to test them again. So that's kind of nice. All right, and then we have some database logic. This is just EF code to like add a to-do item. Post usually means create or add. And then lastly, here's another action result. Created at route, what does that mean? Created means in HTTP lingo, return a 201, 201 created. That's how you politely tell the client, I created this resource for you, okay? At route means, and it's here. This is where it is. This is its identity, its URI. And the way the, that identity gets set up is by identifying the route. Here's the name of the default Web API route, and then stuffing in the values that you need to in order to generate a link out of that, that route, so the ID, for example, in this case. Okay? And this will actually put a standardized header in the response, which is the location header that will tell the client, this is where the thing's created. You can go here. All right. Wonderful. Let's, let's, let's run it. Let's do some stuff. And we're to uh, play around, well, actually, before we get there, let's go ahead and let the browser come up. All right, so how do I know what URI to type here? Routing, right? A API slash the name of the controller. So API slash to do's. All right, what do we got here, IE? So right now it's um, talking to EF, and EF is setting up the database, and we got something, and we got bracket, bracket. So that's, uh, that means there's no to-dos. That's Jason speak for there are no to-dos. So that's because we haven't added any. Okay, let's go add some. So to do add the adding part for to starters, I'm gonna get up my, uh, our, everyone's favorite HTTP tool, uh, and we're going to send some requests to create some to-dos. Okay, so I need the URI for the web API. There it is. Okay, API slash to-dos. Let's execute. Okay, there's the result that we saw before, right? Raw. Bracket, bracket, nothing very interesting. Let's create some to-dos. So post, we're gonna post to to-dos, and what are we gonna post? We're gonna co post some JSON. Okay, and let's see, what do we need here? We need a title, right? Because title was required. I can't do this uh, without title, so get a haircut. Okay, and that's, I think that was all that was actually required to post a to-do. Let's try it, execute. All right, we got 201. What does 201 mean? Created, right? So I mean, yeah, look, even Fiddler's nice enough to even tell us this was a, the resource was actually created. And if we look down in here, we'll even see there's this location header very, way down at the bottom that's telling me where it was created. Do you believe it? Should we see? Should we try it? So one, let's get rid of this stuff. That was the URI, right? 
And not post, we're gonna get it. Ah, what's going on? Don't know what that was. Oh, I'm still capturing, stop capturing. There we go. All right, execute a get on, on that new URI and voila, get a haircut. Well, there's my new resource. Okay, now when I, uh, when I get it, I can ask for it in the particular format that I'd like. And the way you do that in HTTP is with accept. So I accept, by default, it'll, if you don't say anything, it'll just give you JSON. But if I say, I accept XML, please. Always say please. And voila, you'll notice that I'm getting XML in the response. Here we can see the raw, lovely angle brackets. Look at this lovely chunk of XML. There it is, in all of its glory, okay? Um, yeah, and oh, let's do um, uh, one thing I forgot to show. If we go back to post, and we want uh, content type, again, application, JSON. Uh, let's say I don't specify a title. Like I say, is done uh, true or something like that. You know, this is obviously wrong. Like, like I didn't put the title in there. I can't possibly post this. What's going to happen? Notice I get that a uh, 400. An HTTP lingo 400 means that's a bad request. That doesn't make any sense. You can't do that. And if I look at the the response, you'll notice I'm even getting the validation state being sent back, the model state being sent back to me to tell me, hey guy, uh, the title field is required. So you know, if you want to do this right, you need to put the title next time. Okay? So that was that. You know. Check the, checking the model state in the, the, the post action. You remember this piece of code right here? That's that piece of code in action. That's validation working for you. Okay, now uh, I mentioned there's, you, you can do whatever format you want. Let me, let me stop here and go back into my Web API config, and I'm gonna do config.formatters.add, and here we have the new Beeson media type formatter. Like, to support a format, all you gotta do is add, oh, did I type it right? Yep, I did, okay. All you gotta do is add a formatter, and it will just seamlessly work with content negotiation. The new Beeson support is built on JSON.net. JSON.net's always supported Beeson. We just didn't expose it. We've added a media type formatter so that it's now actually exposed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Newton King. Uh, and let's go ahead and run that again. And let's go back now, and let's, uh, where was my get? Let's try it like this one, right? And composer, uh, well, get, um, accept application slash Beeson this time. Or Bison? Beeson? Bison? How many people think Beeson? How many people think Bison? Uh, what is what is Beeson? What is this thing, Dan? We don't even know what you're talking about. Um, it is a binary encoding of JSON, okay? Uh, there's a spec out there, beastinspec.org, that you can go look at. And it's designed, was designed for three things for, uh, you know, reduce the payload size. You can get reductions about 20, 25%, depending on the payload. In some few cases, it's actually a little larger, but that's because it's also designed for traversability to make it really easy to, to parse. Um, and it's a format that's actually used by uh, MongoDB, like for the document uh, DB storage. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a thing. All right, let's execute this. And I got a 200 OK. If we look at the response, voila, we got some crazy chunk of bison or bison, whatever you call it on the, on the wire, OK? So format's super easy. Just add in the formatter. All right. Um, now let's look at the, I, I promised you that we could generate help documentation for you. So let me do that. So I'm going to add a NuGet package. Everything we do, it's on NuGet. Add manage NuGet package. OK, we're going to go to, I'll just do it from the local feed, help page. <laughs> All right, here's the help page. What is the help page? Help page is actually just an MVC area that knows how to examine the Web API runtime and generate documentation about your HTTP endpoints, what their URIs are, what verbs they support, what your formats are, and so forth, okay? So I added that. So that brought in the help page and MVC now because that's, it's that MVC is a UI rendering technology. Web API is not for generating HTML, really. Uh, MVC, though, is, is great for that, so we use that. Uh, and I think I have to wire it up to, so area, registration, yep, register all areas, whoops. That's just the uh, MVC way of saying use areas. Areas are good, okay. Uh, and then, um, heck, uh, why don't I make some changes here? Like I've talked about attribute routing. You know, the, this resource is set up so that if you want all of them, you go to slash to-dos. If you want just one, you get go to slash to-dos slash the ID. Some people don't like the S. I don't know, it's more of an aesthetic thing. So, but if you wanted like the get to-do to just be to-do slash one, we can do that. 
So API slash to do, and then curly brace ID. Okay, so this is attribute routing, where you can just add attributes to your actions or your controller to specify this is what I want the route to be for this piece of code. Okay, and it composes beautifully with the ASP.NET routing because ASP.NET route, like the the route table routes, you know, remember this thing over here, this thing right here. These, the, if a request comes in through that route, it, it will never land on an action that has an explicit attribute route. If you put an attribute route on there, you, that means this is the route for this thing, nothing else, okay? So they, they compose really, really well. You can, you can use both default routes and attribute routes and mix and match, no problem. That's what I'm gonna do here, okay? So I would expect that will show up in the help page then, right? Uh, and then let's build, make sure we're building, and let's publish. Okay, so now I'm in the publish version. Notice that it's picked up all these settings. Where did it get those? So when I set up the Azure website at the beginning of creating the project, it downloaded a publishing profile and that knows all about my uh, Azure account and the settings that it needs to publish. If we wait here for a second, it'll even, uh, it knows that I uh, asked for a database and it'll pull down the right connection string. All right, great, let's we'll go for it. Go, here we go. My first Web API demo on Azure websites. There it is. Do we have anything there? Is there a help page? Keep my fingers crossed. And voila. Okay, so here we're generating documentation for you. Let's see if it worked. Notice, um, oh, can you let me control share plus? Notice that get API to do, there's no S, right? But get API to do's, when you ask for them all, that's attribute routing in, in, uh, in effect. All right, uh, let's also look at one of these guys. If we click on them, zoom back out. Okay, some new enhancements to the help page. You'll notice you're getting type information here. It's saying, hey, uh, when you post a to-do, you need to post a to-do item, and it needs these properties, and here's the type of the properties, and here's even the data annotations information, like, you know, is it required, the string max length, all that stuff is just right here, automatically picked up on your help page. And then it gives you some sample payloads for what you could send, you know, if you're sending JSON, it looks like this, if you're sending XML, uh, formula encoded data, BSIN's supported, we don't, bother putting a blob of binary goop there. Go read the spec. <laughs> I love that. Go read the spec. All right, okay, so there. That's your, your first web API. Make sense? So a bunch of new features, things that were new in um, 2.1 that you saw there, uh, the new help page improvements, the BSIM media type formatter. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff there in 2.1 as well, um, uh, global error handling and uh, some other smaller features, but that, that's at least a, an initial look. Okay, now let's talk about this REST thing and, and OData. So REST is one of those great topics that I feel like you can talk about for a long time and still not really know what the heck, what, what, you're, what you're talking about. So uh, REST is an architectural style. It was, there was a dissertation that was, that was, was written about the, uh, the, the principles used for the architecture of the web. It's defined by a set of constraints. And this is why it's always kind of hard to say, well, what is REST? Well, you have to list out all the constraints for what REST is. You know, it's a client-server architecture with stateless and cacheable and layered and uniform interface, et cetera. But the nice thing about it is it induces a bunch of properties like uh, performance and scalability and reliability and so forth. We, and we know it works because the web works. So that's why it's interesting. Um, it's not a protocol in of itself. Like, it's not a, uh, a technology. Uh, however, OData is a protocol. OData is a standard that actually just went through the OASIS. So uh, OData v4 is now an official OASIS standard, which is pretty cool. Uh, OData is a standard HP-based protocol for interacting and building REST-based data services. It's fairly, fairly, fairly data-centric, and it defines a, a bunch of um, conventions and standards for doing common web API things, like how do you do rich querying? How do you do paging of your data down to the client? You know, sometimes you want to give them a next link and tell them, here's 10, but here, if you want the next 10, go here. How do you represent that? Um, how do you tell them how many there are total in the whole count, even, even though you're only giving them 10 at a time? Uh, how do you deal with relationships between data? Like, maybe I want the to-do lists, but I don't want all the to-do items yet until I ask for them. You know, how do you do that? How do you get the links so that you can uh, navigate through the relationships in your entities? Uh, the nice thing about OData, because it's a standard, it does have a rich ecosystem of clients, uh, and Web API supports, supports OData. We have a great OData stack. Uh, our philosophy around OData and Web API is to give you flexibility and uh, choice. Like, we, we will give you components uh, for the different parts of the OData spec, and you can bring as much to the, ta to the table as you want. It's not an all or nothing deal. 
for example, if you like the OData query syntax for uh, representing rich queries on the, uh, in the URI, feel free to use that. And in fact, feel free to use it over any format you like. We, we, you can just put an attribute on your method and say, I support OData queries here. Uh, we give you uh, the formatters for uh, creating uh, OData v3 and soon OData v4 uh, payloads, both the JSON and the atom-based payloads. Uh, we know how to parse OData, the OData pass. We know how to take the queries and turn them into link expressions and apply them. Uh, you can use as little or as much as you want. And the nice thing about it is you have complete control. We have the complete context of the request. You're not like, you know, looking at the request pipeline a little bit here or a little bit there in a sort of an event-based model. You have the full control of the request to do whatever you want. If, some, if, some, if you want to change things a little bit, go ahead, no problem. To create a no data service with Web API is three simple steps. Uh, you just need to define your model. OData is a model-driven um, way of defining Web APIs. You're very upfront about what your entity data model is for what you're trying to define. But then, and the nice, good thing about that is that once you've defined the model, you can just say, create the URI space for me. Here's my model. Just figure it out. One line of code. So you don't have to go and do a lot of uh, routing yourself. Odit, Odit, you, we can figure that out for you based off of your model. That's pretty nice. And then lastly, you need to go implement those resources, those entities. So three simple steps. And it's even easier now in uh, VS 2013 because we have scaffolders that can set this all up for you. Let me show you that. Whoa, time is flying. Okay. All right, uh, da, da, da. let's create a um, OData demo. All right, yes, Web API. Good, let's not create an Azure website this time around. Okay. Let's create a class. Do item again, and do I have my other one up? That would be really nice. Let's just grab it. I think debate whether or not it's faster for me to just type it again or to grab it. Okay. Build. We don't need this stuff. Okay, we have a model type again. Now let's create an OData service. Add controller. Now here, instead of selecting the normal Web API controller scaffolders, I'm gonna pick OData with EF in the back. That sounds good. Okay, uh, what's my model type to do? I need a new DB context. Again, that looks good. And now this, the name I'm gonna use for the controller is gonna map to the entity set name in my OData service. So it's kind of important, so we get that. This is gonna scaffold out for me an OData service. And this OData service will have a bunch of additional capabilities beyond what a normal Web API service would be able to do. You'll be able to project um, a, a standardized metadata format for your entity data model. Dollar metadata support will be there, which you can use from uh, like client generators like ad service reference. It will uh, um, set up um, you'll be able to do relationships. You'll be able to do query over the data. Let's, let's take a look here. Okay, so what did this scaffold? So this created, looks pretty similar. Instead of deriving from API controller, it's now deriving from OData controller. Uh, so that means that the OData formers, formatters are wired up. You'll notice that here's that queryable attribute that I mentioned. This says that when you get the to-dos, you can do interesting queries over them, okay? And then, you know, you can get individual to-do items, put post, OData supports patch. Patch is different than put. Like put is like replace the whole thing. Patch means here's just a couple of the properties. You know, change them uh, and don't touch anything else. So that's a nice semantic that you get from OData. Uh, and you can do things in here, like if you want to support paging, you can say, what is it, uh, page size, I think? Uh, yeah, page size equals 10. And if you just say that, that means that as the results go back to the client, they'll only go back in chunks of 10, and you'll get an X link automatically to the, to, to the next 10. So that's pretty cool. If, you want, if you're worried, you know, you've got a catalog of 10,000 things, and you're like, hmm, I don't want to just expose all of those to the, to the client. This is a great way for you to page it down to the client and throttle it. I'm not going to do that right now. Okay. Uh, there was one little thing that it told me I had to do in this comment. Like remember, there's three steps to an audio service, right? I have to define the model, I have to set up the route, and I have to implement it. Well, this is the implementation part that we got here. Okay, but I need, still need the model and the route. Well, it, it, this little comment helps me with that. If I go into my Web API config and just copy that piece of code in here like it told me to do, and resolve some usings. Okay, uh, now what do we got? Well, we got this model builder 
This is something that can build my EDM model, and I'm defining an entity set, uh, a collection of to-dos, basically, and what the model builder, the reason why it's a convention-based model builder is because it's gonna examine that model type, you know, grovel through it and figure out what its properties are, what their types are, relationships, and so forth, and build up the entity data model for me. Now, I can always go back and tweak it, uh, but this is sort of a quick and easy way to get going. And then here's my route, map data route, and you'll notice it's just one route. I just say, here's the name of the route, Here's the prefix for the OData service. You know, I want my OData service to live off of this root. Uh, and then here's my model. Figure the rest out. Okay? Let's run it. All right, do we have an OData service? If I browse to slash OData, what am I gonna get? Something that doesn't want to open up very nicely. And um, let's do OData. All right, you know. I think IE doesn't like to render XML for me. Let me, let me try here. Okay, uh, Chrome always sends an, an XML accept header, so it's a little more convenient to do when you're dealing with XML payloads. That's all, we're, we're on the web team, but we love all browsers, it's really, okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so notice that I have a working code, I've got a service document, a la uh, Adam, I have a full uh, dollar metadata thing here. Um, you know, there's uh, my to-do item type, and if we look at it, it's got the right properties, so it's ID, a title is done. Well, what is, what the, that's interesting. Anyway, uh, and then it has an entity set. So let's, let's see if we can actually uh, call the, the OData service. It's set, according to this, there is an entity set to-do. So if I ask for to-dos, I should get something back. What am I gonna get? This is where EF is firing up, and I expect no to-dos, and while I get no to-dos, but this is the new JSON Lite format in NoData. It's fairly, fairly you know, much less of uh, these type of metadata attributes. It's fairly compact, very comparable to what you'll get with JSON.net, uh, and uh, that's a working NoData service. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going instead of like showing you payloads just because I want to get to some other stuff, but uh, that's how you can get going with NoData. All right, we scaffold. All right, uh, in Web API 2.2, the next release, we are going to build out support for OData v4. If you haven't heard already, uh, we have already started this. The nightly builds have bits. Uh, it's all based on the uh, v4 support that's built into OData lib. Uh, that's already been published. Uh, it's side by side with our OData v3 support. So if you want to have, uh, if you already have a v3 service and you want to add a v4 version, that's, that's totally fine. You can put them, there are two different assemblies, two different protocols, they live happily side by side. Public nightly builds are available. It's got, the, the new bits actually have a ton of new features in addition to just supporting OData v4. Model aliasing, support for functions. What is model aliasing? That's the ability to really fine tune your, your entity data model after the fact, like go and tweak it, rename properties, use uh, data contract attributes on your model types to rename things. Um, uh, functions and enums, those are OData protocol features. Model query uh, uh, annotations are a way for you to uh, annotate your types to say what types of queries you allow. Sometimes with OData, people are a little skittish because they're like, wow, this looks like it's exposing my whole database on the internet. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Well, no, that's not true. With Web API, you have complete control over which queries are, are allowed and not, and you can limit it to just a set of queries that you want to expose, and you should do that. That's a good idea. We make it, we make it easy for you to do that. Uh, OData is gonna get attribute routing, just like uh, normal Web API does. Uh, dollar format's now a first class feature. Uh, and we're gonna support singletons and uh, containment. Singletons means you can have a single entity as a top level concept in addition to entity sets. And containment means you can have entities that are not top level concepts but are contained within another entity set. Those are uh, uh, features that are gonna uh, be available in the OData v4 stack. Okay, that's OData. Um, so let's, great, that's, that's a lot of infrastructure for building web APIs. How can you now actually consume those services from the client? Uh, well, there's this wonderful concept called portable libraries. What is a portable library? It's very simple. There are .NET APIs in all these different places, on the phone, on Windows Store, full desktop, Silverlight, you know, Xbox, and the APIs look the same, don't they? Like a lot of the time, most of the time they work exactly the same, they're supposed to. Um, so why can't I write one binary that you know, uses string here and then run that binary over there? Like I should, I should be able to do that. Well, you can. And that, the way you do that is by creating portable libraries. Portable libraries can use the intersection of the APIs that are supported on the platforms that you're trying to target. So if you're trying to target Windows Phone and Store, you can write a portable library that uses anything that's available on both platforms. 
Uh, sometimes people get surprised when they start running portable libraries and they're like, oh my goodness, like all these APIs disappeared. Oh, this is terrible, how did this happen? Well, they're not there because they're not available on one of the platforms that, that you're targeting, okay? So that's how you think about it, it's the intersection. You pick which platforms you want and we provide tooling and, uh, to create libraries that target that intersection of API surface area. That's what we do. Okay, now we are going to create uh, a portable library to consume mobile services. But uh, before we get there, I wanna, I'm gonna move forward a little bit and we're gonna do it in a secure fashion, okay? We're gonna do it securely. So, you know, being secure is important. You know, we're gonna do it for real. You know, no, no pretending. Like, you know, this, so I, oh, you kinda can't see the top, can you? But it's a, this is a suboptimal security setup, okay? We, don't, we do not want that kind of security. All right, how are you gonna do security for your web APIs? First and foremost, you need to have your authorization logic. That's what makes your web API secure. None of the authentication pieces, tokens, blah, 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 none of that makes your web API secure. You need to have an authorization layer that prevents requests from making it to your web API if they are not authorized, okay? Don't forget, I've done occasionally a demo where I was talking about security and the requests were working great and then I got to the end and looked at my web API and lo and behold, everything was going anonymously because there was no authorization logic there at all. Don't forget to bracket authorize, okay? That's what we're talking about here. The way you do authorization in web API, very similar to MVC, is using authorization filters. Um, the authorized attribute will check to make sure there's a, val a valid principle on the thread and that principle will con contain a set of claims that you trust, that you, you set up the system to, uh, to provide a set of claims that you, you trust and you make a decision based off of that set of, set of claims, okay? That, so may, don't forget your authorization logic. You can apply it globally, per controller, per action. Now where are you gonna get those claims? The setup we're gonna do here, whew, in eight minutes, no problem, is we're gonna use OAuth2 and uh, bearer tokens. A bearer token is just a, actually, it's just a concept where you have a token that, that, as long as you have it, if you're the bearer of it, then you have whatever authorization that, that token allows you to do. So don't, don't hand out your bearer tokens, right? Those, those are for, for you, and they're not meant to be uh, shared around. It's, this is in contrast to like a proof of possession system. Um, OAuth2 has a, uh, there's, there's two specs. Uh, OAuth2 defines a framework for how you can set up flows where a, client app, a piece of code, can get authorization by the, whoever owns the resource to access a protected resource. Let me say that again. OAuth2 is a framework that allows client apps to get authorization to access a protected resource. And you, that protected resource is your web API, okay? That's what we're trying to build. We're trying to build a protected resource that client apps can get authorization to access. Now sometimes the way that authorization occurs is that the, the client will um, there'll be a user involved in a browser, and the client will redirect the user's browser to some trusted component that the user will have a little private conversation with, and the, that trusted component, that, that authority will ask the user, hey, who are you, user? Okay, I've authenticated you. Okay, this client app wants to see your photos. Is that okay? You know, it's a consent screen, yes, no. Oh, okay, good, yes, then fine. And it bounces back to the client app. It now has authorization that it can use to go access the user's stuff. Now. That's the fancy version of OAuth. The simpler version of OAuth is the client gets authorization by uh, getting the user's username and password. Uh, and if you trust the client app, that, that's fine. So the, the user gives the username and password to the client app. The client can then exchange that for a token, for a limited access bearer token, an access token, and then use that to call the web API. It's a good idea to do that exchange. So that way the client doesn't have to hold on to the user's username and password, which you probably don't want to do, because then you gotta figure out a, a safe place to store it, you know, all those news headings where passwords got stolen, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of scary stuff. And, so then, and the access token is the thing that goes on the wire. That's a much better thing to go on the wire because it can be limited in life, uh, uh, lifespan and its scope of access as opposed to the user's username and password. If that happens to leak someplace, uh-oh, well, game over, right? They, they got everything. So the way this is gonna work is we're gonna use bearer tokens and we're gonna set up a security setup like this where we have a client app, it's gonna talk to uh, a protected resource and it needs a bearer token in order to do so. If it sends a message without that token, no dice. Uh, but if it has a token, then it, it, can go, it will go through a piece of middleware. This, remember we talked about Owen before? A piece of middleware that knows how to validate that token, turn it into a set of claims, and then your authorization layer will check those claims. Notice that the request, did you see how the envelope went all the way through the middleware? Did you see that? Like that's important. The middleware is not gonna turn the request around. 
Your authorization will do that. So that's important. You need the middleware to, is just going to look at tokens and validate them. If they're good, it'll turn into principles. But it's not authorizing. Your authorization layer is what will then make a decision, oh, it's okay for this thing to be accessed anonymously. Or no, not okay. 401, get out the door. Okay, that's what we're going to do. This is how you set up that piece to accept bearer tokens in Web API and in an OWN, actually any OWN pipeline. This piece of code is actually independent of Web API. If you're using Nancy or, uh, I don't know, even MVC or whatever, you can use this line of code to accept bearer tokens. Use OAuth, uh, uh, what is it? Use OAuth bearer authentication. This thing will ac accept tokens and, and, and validate them. Okay? Now you need tokens. Where do you get them from? Well, you, I talked about that authority, that, that trusted piece of code that issues, uh, can issue tokens. Uh, that's, we call that an authorization server in OAuth 2 Lingo. And that's the thing that's going to be issuing the tokens. And you have some options for creating an authorization server. You can create your own. We give you OWN components for setting up your own little authorization server that lives in your app. And it can accept username and passwords and issue tokens that you can then validate. Um, it's a fairly lightweight, simple solution. Um, you know, it's sort of roll your own, bring your own code type, type of uh, a solution. If you want a full featured uh, UI with, that allows you to register clients and manage consent screens and support like, all the different flows of OAuth 2, you might want to use something that's a little bit more uh, fleshed out, like the, the Think Texture guys have an uh, authorization server implementation that's really good. Uh, we work, we've worked with them on our authorization server story, and their, their solution is, is a, a great full sort of you know, turnkey product solution. Um, but this, both of these options are still you are owning the authorization server. You're responsible for keeping it up and running and secure which can be a burden, uh, which is why a lot of times people opt to use someone else's authorization server, like a service that's been hardened and, and uh, set up to handle scale. And there are a bunch of those. Uh, Azure AD can operate as an authorization server. Uh, Azure AD is a directory in the cloud, and it, can, it supports OAuth 2 authorization flows. If you have an on-premise scenario, you can use your ADFS uh, installation as an authorization server. That way you can support corporate accounts. Uh, Azure Mobile Services. Uh, supports uh, like social logins through an authorization server. You can, you can use their stuff. So those are options where you're going to basically outsource your token issuing uh, uh, burden to someone else. So that's less code in your app, less you know, scalability and security concerns. Okay. Um, but let's go ahead and see if we can set up at least the simple flow with username and password ourselves from a client mobile application. Okay? We're going to collect the user's credential, username, password. We're going to exchange them for an access token using a little bit of piece of authorization server middleware. And then we're going to use that access token to securely call a web API all within the next three minutes. Right. Okay, great. <laughs> all right, let's see what we got. I'm going to have to show you uh, the pre canned version. Uh, instead, I was going to try and like build this all from scratch in front of you. Uh, we're not going to do that. Okay, uh, let's do. This guy. Okay. Let me close all documents and we will start and see what is in here. How does this thing work? Okay, so first of all, uh, here's our web API, my first secure web API test. Okay, and I've got a simple little web API controller in here. It's just a me controller. And it's very simple. All this guy's going to do is when you call it, it's, it's, it's protected. There's that authorization check, right? Don't forget that. That means there's a principle on the thread that somewhere someone decided this was an okay set of claims to use. Um, and it just turns around the name claim that's in that principle and says, well, here's who this person is. This is the me, a me endpoint, okay? That's all this thing's going to do, is give you the identity based off of the token. Very simple. Just, and so what we're going to try to do is create an app that can log the user in, make a request to this me endpoint, and display the username. Pretty simple, okay? Now, to, uh, that's the web API piece. Now we need that Owen middleware, right? The, the thing that's going to accept those bearer tokens and turn them into claims. How do we set that up? Um, and uh, I'm not going to be able to show all the pieces uh, of how you set up a NuGet, but the, there's a package that you're going to want in order to get the Owen pipeline set up in an ASP.NET app. And all you got to do is install this package. That's it. Just install it. Microsoft.Owen.Host.System.Web. And in our templates, it's already installed. So if you're doing file new project, new web API, and clicking the authentication options, this stuff is already set up. I'm just showing you from, from scratch so you can get the idea of what's involved here. 
okay? When you set that up, that means Owen is now enabled and you can set up an Owen pipeline. The convention for doing that is using a startup class, okay? Here's my startup class. Um, you create a configuration method that takes an app builder and then you just use stuff. You use middleware. And there's that first line of code. Use OAuth bearer tokens and done. Now, if there's a bearer token on the request, it'll get validated and turned into claims, okay? Now, we also wanted to have a way to issue tokens, to be able to give tokens to people. That's an authorization server, and there's a piece of ON middleware that can help you do that. That's the uh, OAuth authorization server, server middleware. Now, it has a few more knobs. Actually, it has a lot of knobs, but I'll, I will show you the ones that are important for just getting the username password uh, scenario working. Now, uh, this is the cardinal sin of security right here. So, so I am doing this solely because for local development, using the test, the test certificates um, has some pain. Like if you're using the phone emulator, you need to somehow tell the phone emulator that this test certificate is okay and don't, don't make the you know, client request blow up. So for solely for demo purposes and you know, local development, I turned off the check that makes sure everything's going over HPS because uh, SSL is absolutely required for these flows. Remember, if your bearer token gets out, whoever gets it now has the, that same power. You don't want your bearer token to get out, okay? So require uh, SSL. You tell it where do you want people to go get tokens, so slash token. And then you wire up some events, a provider that provides uh, hooks for events that you can then use to plug in some code into the authorization server. And the key piece of code that we want here is, of course, how do you want to validate the username and password? That's the main thing we, want, we care about here, right? Okay. So that's this event on grant resource owner credentials. So the resource is the protected resource. The resource owner is the person who's going to give their username and password and say, it's okay for you to access my stuff. And then I just wrote some simple hard-coded things here that says, if the user is Dan Roth 27, the 27th Dan Roth or the 28th one, and, their pa or, and the password is the, the, you know, the most popular password in the world, then great. And then we issue a set of claims. And the only claim I'm putting in here is the name claim, which is the username. And then you say, yeah, good, granted. Here's, here's the stuff you should use to make a token. From there on, the middleware will just make a token for you, and done, okay? So that's, the, that's the, the pieces of code that you need to set up an authorization server in your app, and that's it, okay? Now to call it, here's a portable library that I created that has a little login, uh, not the login view model, we want the client. There's the client. This is the piece of code that's gonna be able to go get a token. And all you need to do is send a post request with these three parameters in the post body. This is the OAuth 2 standard flow for, for getting a token. And you know, in this, in this model where you're owning the authorization server yourself, you do have to write this code. Because OAuth is, is not, it's not a protocol, it's a framework, and it's not actually something that you can just write a generic client library for. For different authorization servers, they may provide you a client library that's specific to their authorization server. Like Zumo, uh, Azure Mobile Services will give you a client library. Azure AD will give you a client library for their service. If you're rolling your own, well, you're kind of on your own. But it's not that hard. You know, three parameters, okay? This, you send this post request, back comes a token in a JSON payload, and there's the access token that we're reading out. Okay, that's all you gotta do to get a token. Now to, to then use that token, you need to put it on the request in a in the standard HP way. And the standard HP way of putting a, a uh, some sort of credential on the request is using the authorization header. You can see I'm setting the authorization header on this HP client to make requests to that me endpoint. Because I gotta have a principal, it's got authorize on it, so I need something that, in order to be able to call that endpoint. Uh, so I put a bearer token on there, I can call me, the, the token will go in the header, and then the, uh, the middleware, the authorization server, uh, not the authorization, the bearer token middleware, We'll look for that, that header and pull it off, validate the signature, see if it's issued to you and not to some other person, and turn it into a set of claims. Okay, let's see if it works. Let's run it. Then we just have some mobile code that's gonna use this portable library to call the web API. Now, um, actually, you know, it would be interesting. Let's, let's go and, oh, did I, first of all, did I fire up the web API? That's important. I need to make sure I fire up the web API. Nope. So debug, start new instance. Okay, I apologize for going a little late here. Let's stop capturing and let's compose. So first of all, if I try to make a call to API slash me, let me get rid of all this stuff, execute. Notice 401, right? That's, that's right. And notice that the, the response is telling me, you didn't provide a bearer token, 401 unauthorized, no good. Okay, so I need a token. 
how do I get a token? I go to that token endpoint, right? So I want to post something to token, right? And so I'm going to use, uh, I have to specify the content type. Application um, uh, form URL encoded. That's just what ODOF does. And then the three things, grant type equals password and username equals, let's do me, and password equals the most popular password in the world. And if this should then give me a token, oh, rapid request, what did I do wrong? Then what, what? <laughs> Username is, oh, oh, very good. You guys are, you guys are awesome. You guys are paying attention. 200, oh, there's a token. Whew. Now supposedly, supposedly, I should be able to like grab this thing now and go make a get to me, right? And I should be able to say authorization bearer, uh, and that big long piece of stuff. And I need to delete some of the stuff in the front. And now before, what did this do? Remember, it returned 401. And if this was all right, oh my goodness, cross my fingers, because I don't have any more time to try and debug this. Did it work? Did it work? Raw, Dan Raw 27. Okay, now the client apps, this, that's all this is doing. That's all this is doing here. Like if I type password in here, uh, type password correctly, I'm going to hit some breakpoints for all of my lovely uh, MVVM logic that I spend lots of time. You can't even see it, but you can see in the corner, is hello, you can see the 27 at the end, right? Believe me, it's there. It's there. Same logic, one authorization server. It's not that hard to set up. You guys have been great. Thank you for sticking it out. I'm happy to stick around for questions afterward to, uh, to talk about how to do this. And uh, go build awesome web APIs and mobile applications. Thank you so much.